the uh, the Kef LS60. It's like a smaller blade, and it sounds really, really good. I just got the new extension for the Clipple Near Field Scanner that allows me to measure tower speakers a little bit more efficiently, and I thought this is the way I'm going to start it. So here we go. The speakers retail typically for $69.99, but they are currently on sale for $49.99. Part of the reason that I'm kind of trying to get this video out so soon, I was going to wait a week, but the sale ends at the end of the month. And if you have been waiting for somebody to review it, not just me, but somebody third party to review it with data, now's your chance. Now you're about to see the data, you can make the appropriate decision and I'll cheap plug for myself here. If after watching this review, you find yourself encouraged enough to go ahead and buy these speakers, please, please consider using my affiliate link in the description below. That gives me a small commission at no additional cost for you. I think the speakers are great. It doesn't matter that I'm getting a commission from them. You can see the data and you can make your own judgment call. So let's move on to some of the specs while I show you a video of the speaker outside of my backyard because the inside of my house is terrible looking and I'm embarrassed to show it. This speaker uses four five and a quarter inch drivers for midwoofers, two on each side of the speaker, a single concentric mid-range tweeter unit. The mid-range is a four inch and the tweeter is a three quarter inch. There are all sorts of inputs for HDMI, Toslink, digital coax, analog RCA, and then there are all sorts of streaming options such as Spotify, Amazon Music, Deezer, Cobuzz, I can go on and on. If you're interested in finding any more information about that, I encourage you to check the manufacturer's website because I'm not gonna read you their spec sheet. But the one thing I do wanna note is on their spec sheet, they mentioned that the maximum SPL is 111 decibels at one meter. And that is the one thing I think that some of you might, might have trouble with if you have a large, large room. So let's continue on. I'll show you what I'm talking about. This really is a very neutral speaker in that it plays almost flat from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And in fact, when I put them in my room and set them up, I had them in my living room, I had them about maybe a foot off of the wall. The reason I did that is because I don't have a lot of floor space in my living room. Normally I listen to speakers in my bedroom, but I wanted to try them out in my living room with my television hooked up to my Apple TV. And in that case, there was actually just too much bass. So with the app, I went and adjusted the bass contours. And there's actually a mode in there called wall mode that allows you to not only adjust the bass, but it can also impact some adjustment into the mid range. And I'll show you some data for that in a little bit. I'll spend a couple minutes on my subjective thoughts. Now I listen to all sorts of music. I listened to movies and I watched a couple television shows. I really had no complaints subjectively. I mentioned, you know, the bass thing being the only real complaint that I had, but otherwise the speakers are very neutral. The music that I listened to sounded really dang good. And I noticed that in certain tracks where there's drum movement, anything by Phil Collins is, has got excellent drums and don't care anymore is a great song with a lot of panning drum track at the beginning of it. As those drums are panning between the left and right, it sounds like it's behind the speaker. And I just, I love that effect. Now that could be cited bias because they're coincident speakers. And I've always thought that maybe they stage deeper. I don't know. There's nothing in the frequency response to make me think that. And it could be that I was using the phase correction mode where the mids, mid woofers and the tweeters are all pretty much time aligned so everything arrives at the same time in your seated position. And subjectively, anecdotally, I will say that when you have a speaker that is well time aligned and the frequency response is really smooth because you can have one or the other without having the other. But when you have both of them doing that at the same time, it creates just a cohesive, cohesive sound voices are locked in where they're supposed to be. Images are placed in the soundstage where they're supposed to be. Now this speaker to me, normally I would say that Kef speakers, they seem to have a little bit more narrow directivity than I prefer. I didn't really find that to be the case with this particular speaker. Now I haven't gone back and compared this against something like the Reference One or the R3 Meta or anything like that, but just subjectively, 
I felt like the soundstage was pretty large. I was listening at about 15 degrees off axis because that seemed to be the sweet spot for me to get a little bit more room involvement because in my living room, the sidewalls are six feet away. Whereas in my bedroom, the sidewalls are three feet away. So I wanted a little bit more toe out to get a little bit more sidewall reflection to give me a little bit more enhanced width, at least the sense of stereo width. And in that case, it seemed to work out quite well. The tone and the timbre of voices, really good. Uh, my, my choices of music are all over the map. I listen to all sorts of different stuff, but I really was enjoying uh, the John Mayer Gravity album. I'm sorry, is it Continuum? It's the Continuum album that has Gravity on it. I really like that album. So I, I plugged up and listened to that for a while and just really enjoyed it. It's it's not easy for me to talk subjectively about a speaker when it seems to do a lot of things right. When it's not doing things that I don't like, it's easier for me to define those. But I'm not one to make up superlatives or super duper awesome words to describe a sound that I would say sounds neutral. And in this case, I think truthfully, the best way to describe the speaker is it's a neutral sounding speaker that adapts well to position and your location. And for that reason, I would recommend this speaker. While the speaker is very neutral, another very good aspect of it is that because it's a good concentric design, you don't have to listen to it directly firing at you. You don't have to listen to it directly on axis. You can actually step off to the side, you can go above or below that tweeter, that mid range by about plus or minus 40 degrees and hear pretty much the same sound. I noticed this when I was walking around my living room. Right? So, when I do my laundry, I have the Apple TV on. I might be listening to music or I might be watching a YouTube video. My back is usually turned, I'm folding stuff, and I'm standing up. I'm not necessarily listening for tonality and things like that, but I can tell a difference with my standard speaker setups between this one, where the coincident one allows me to stand up and walk around the room, and I really don't hear a lot of shift in tonality. The music still sounds the same, or the television still sounds the same, and you had that luxury with this particular speaker. Directly on axis, with the speaker lined up right at your ear, there is a diffraction dip around 10 kilohertz that will take some of the detail out of higher frequency instruments, such as a shaker or a cymbal. That dip is about four to five decibels, and it's possible you're gonna notice it when it's pointed directly at you, but like most coincident designs, it's intended to be pointed slightly off axis. Typically, it'll be cross-firing in front of you, or it'll be pointed out to the side of you. In my case, I prefer to tow speakers out and have them facing off toward the side of me. Left speaker pointing at the left ear, but maybe a little bit further over here. Right speaker pointing at the right ear, but maybe a little bit further over here. That 10 to 20 degrees of toe out, that helps to improve the stereo width, but it also helps to smooth that frequency response. And in this particular case, doing that does work to your advantage, whereas some speakers may not benefit from that and it could actually make things worse. Now, there are a ton of input options. I already mentioned those. I will leave it up to you to go and research that more if you need to. The other thing is the build quality on these speakers is ridiculous. They're super duper heavy. Uh, I mean, super duper heavy for a speaker. They're about 70 pounds or 72 pounds each. So when I had to hoist them up onto the stand, you can imagine I'm holding the speaker like this and setting it up on a five foot stand. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be Hercules to move them, but picking them up out of the box, just, you know, be careful if you have back problems, you might hurt yourself. While there's a whole lot to say on the positive side, there are a few cons. I mentioned one earlier is the Max SPL. In my listening at about 10 feet away for a pair of speakers in the room with the speakers close to the wall, a weighted maximum SPL was between 100 to 105 decibels. 100 was on uncompressed music with about 15 decibels or so of dynamic range. A lot of my music that I listen to has higher dynamic range than more common music as of today. Most music today is gonna to have a dynamic range of like maybe three to six decibels, unfortunately. Now there are caveats, but I wanna mention that the 100 decibels is primarily for music with higher dynamic range, and that may matter to you. The 105 is what I noticed with movies. So I watched Jurassic Park for a little while with these speakers and a couple other movies to try to check out the bass response. And I capped out at about 105 decibels for the pair at about 10 feet away. 
that's pretty dang loud. But if you are in a very large room and you're further away, let's say you're 12 feet away, I'm afraid that the output may not cut it for you. You may find yourself really wishing you had three to six decibels more of output. So keep that in mind. Now, if you are gonna be sitting within 10 feet or so, or maybe you have a smaller space, they'll be good enough in output, I think, that you probably won't have an issue. I mentioned previously that the bass can actually be a bit too much, and I wanna to touch on that again. Out of the box, the standard setting allows the bass extension to get to around 40 hertz. And if you extend it, if you put it on the extended setting, you can get down to about 20 hertz in room without a problem. Even anechoic, I think the F3 is around 23 hertz. That's actually too much bass. But in my case, what I found was that setting the bass setting back to standard didn't really fix the issue. So what I wound up doing was I went into the app and I went into the wall mode and I adjusted the wall mode, which rolls off the bass a little bit more quickly. There are different ways you can set it. I set it to about negative three decibels and that worked for me. And I'll show you objectively what that wall mode does in a second. Another thing that I wish this app had would be parametric equalization. Now I can point back to something like the SVS subwoofers that have an app built in or, or DSP built in and you can use the app to set parametric bands. And I think it's maybe like three or five different bands. I wish that these speakers had the ability to do that. Even if they just gave me three bands of parametric EQ, because I have a couple strong room modes in my living room around 50 Hertz and 120 Hertz. And because of those, there's a lot of excess ringing and lingering of the base modes, base modes, base modes. And it's kind of distracting. And in order to alleviate some of that, I also had to play around with the base settings a little bit more just to get those down a little bit. So if Kef is listening, if there's a way, I personally think a lot of us would benefit from additional EQ bands that we can go in and set ourselves. Now let's talk about the data. All of the data that you're about to see was captured using my Clipple near field scanner. It allows me to take a speaker, measure it in a non-anechoic environment, and that then gives me the actual anechoic raw performance of the speaker itself without any room influence. And that has really been helpful for a speaker like this because when I first set them up, I mentioned the bass seemed a bit much. Well, there's a small little peak, maybe about a decibel, two decibels or so, around 100 hertz, it's a hump in the bass. Knowing that from the data, I didn't have to guess what's going on in the room, I would say, okay, now I can use wall mode and make some adjustments and get kind of closer to where I wanna be subjectively in the room. I also wanna note that everything you're about to see was measured in what they call extended mode. So this is probably the mode that most people are gonna go set their speaker up in initially, and then you'll probably wanna play around with some adjustments to get it tailored to the sound that you like. Frequency response directly on axis with the coincident driver pointed right at your ear. You can see that everything looks pretty good. Now this right here is the dip that I was talking about earlier where I said there's a diffraction dip right around nine to 10 kilohertz. And that could possibly take some air, some shimmer out of certain instruments. Whether you're gonna notice it or not, I can't tell you. There is one individual on my Patreon who said that he felt like there wasn't a lot of detail in the upper frequency. My guess is that right there has something to do with it. Now you can on the app go in and increase the treble by about three decibels. I'll show you that in a second. The bass down here, there's a little bit of a shelf bump. Starting around 200 hertz, it's about one and a half decibels or so, maybe two decibels. And then we can see that things kind of flatten off with the F3 of about 23 hertz. This speaker plays 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with a range of plus or minus three decibels with ease. Now what happens if you do what you should do with the coincident driver, you turn it slightly off axis. Let's see. This is the same thing, but at 15 degrees off axis. You can see that that dip mellowed out. The bass adjustments are all of that. It's the same thing, but that dip mellowed out. For min and max settings on the app, this is what you've got. And I've just normalized the response to zero decibels. The min, you can drop down to negative two on the bass. And then on the treble, you can see it's about negative, what, two and a half, three decibels or so. And then on the max, you can increase the bass up to about three and a half decibels at 20 hertz. And about, I can't even see past this, about three decibels on the higher end. So you kind of get an idea of the swing. For the wall mode, which is what I found the most helpful for me, this is a couple examples of what you can do. Now the maximum is negative 10, which is this red right here. The 
negative five dB is this blue line right here. And that allowed me to kind of get what I wanted. I actually wound up setting it to about negative three decibels or so, I believe. And that to me helped smooth out this bump right here. This is the CEA 2034 data set at zero degrees on axis directly. And then if we look at 15 degrees, kind of the same thing we saw with frequency response. We smoothed out that diffraction dip, but the early reflections directivity, both of them look really good. Now there are some sort of diffraction resonance elements through this two kilohertz to three kilohertz region. Are you going to hear those? I'd really be surprised if you did. Keep in mind that this scale is at 1 20th octave resolution. And if for it to be a, a noticeable thing, you'd have to have a broader range and it would have to be higher in level. This is the estimated interim response at zero, 15 and 30 degrees per the legend. And then if I draw a trend line, this is what we get. Notice I say very little variability, even at 30 degrees off axis. So I'm gonna go back, look, look how closely these follow. That's a good sign of a speaker that has good directivity, both vertically and horizontally. If it has poor directivity, typically what you'll see is wider variance in the crossover region. And that wider variance will typically yield a speaker that may not sound completely neutral in the room, even if it's on axis frequency response measures well, because as you go off axis, maybe the mating from the tweeter to the mid range isn't quite as good as it should have been due to maybe a poorly designed crossover. And in this case, you have the benefit of a coincident driver with a tweeter inside the mid range, but you also have assumedly a really good electronic crossover applied here. Going back to the trend line, I also wanted to note this hump right here. I, I kind of keep harping on that because it is Really the only thing that I had an audible issue with was just the bass, but I wanna make it clear that you can also adjust that with some of the settings in the app. This is the horizontal directivity normalized, and I'm showing this instead of the globe because I think it's important to see a direct comparison here compared to the vertical. What you're gonna notice is they're very similar, but first of all, see that this is about plus or minus 60 degrees at the negative six dB point all the way up to about 20 kilohertz. Now there are some dips through here, but they're relatively mild. There's some peaks here. That's because of the diffraction element. So the off axis response is a little bit higher in level than the on axis response. Remember the on axis, when the tweeter's pointed directly at you, there's that dip around 10 kilohertz or so. Off axis, that dip fills in, and that's why this red increases around that frequency. Now let's look at the vertical, which we have here. And again, it's very much the same as the horizontal. Vertically, there is a little bit more of an inset in this region, but I say that about plus or minus 40 is still really dang good. That means you've got 40 degrees of latitude where you can, that's interesting, I used latitude and I didn't even mean to as a pun. All right, you can stand up and walk around within about 40 degrees and the sound should be pretty similar to what it is when you sit down with the speaker pointed directly at your ear. That works out great because the tweeter itself is at a lower ear level than you would think you would want it when you see it. And sure enough, when I sat down in the chair, the tweeter is probably like this much lower, but at my distance, it's within about 10 degrees. And because I'm within about 10 degrees, I can actually go up to about 30 or 40 degrees and that sound would be very similar. So it's not a lot of effect of change in the sound as you stand up or sit down, or if you're not directly on axis with the tweeter, which in this case, you probably don't wanna be anyway due to diffraction, remember that you're gonna be good. You don't have to worry about being perfectly lined up with that mid-range tweeter coincident driver. You can be a little bit above it or a little bit below it if you need to be. Distortion at 86 decibels at one meter looks really good. 96 decibels at one meter also looks really good, but keep in mind, there's gonna be compression limiting here that's gonna keep the distortion low because the woofers aren't gonna be moving a whole lot. But I really wanted to note that this Distortion is comprised pretty much of second order only through the mid range. Third order is way, way low. This is the multi-tone distortion. And what I found was that due to compression, this speaker was, I was trying to target 96 decibels and it only hit 94 decibels. Usually this green line is representing 96 decibels, but in this case, it's representing 94 decibels. And we can see that the multi-tone distortion looks really good. It's below the personal threshold of 3%. And then what happens if you were to use a subwoofer and cross this over above 80 hertz? Not a whole lot of change. There's some difference in this mid-range area, but really not a lot. So that implies that the mid-woofers don't have a lot of distortion in them. The motor structure is certainly good, and I wouldn't expect 
a real big noticeable difference by high passing in terms of distortion, the capability of the speaker's mid range. This is where we come to the area where some of you are probably gonna say, oh, this is bad. Well, keep in mind, this is a DSP speaker that has limiting built into it. Keth even has a white paper that shows similar results where the maximum SPL limits the bass extension. So you're not gonna have the bass extension at the highest volume as you do at the lowest volume. But I also did find that the maximum SPL, in this case, according to my measurements, uh, is about, if I take this down here, that's about negative three, it's supposed to be 102. Uh, I would say 99 decibels is probably gonna be about the maximum that I measured at one meter. So I don't know how Kef is coming up with 111 decibels, unless they're talking about 111 decibels for a pair at one meter. In that case, in room, I see where that number comes from. Now let's pay attention to this blue line because realistically, this is probably gonna be about the max. And this does jive with what I heard in room where at 96 decibels, 102 decibels in this ballpark is pretty much the maximum that I was able to get for these speakers for music and movies was in that 100 to 105 decibel range that I mentioned earlier. Now I think that's adequate for most people. But again, if you are in a very large room and you're gonna be sitting pretty far away from the speakers, then you're most likely you're gonna want more output. Given the size of these speakers and their overall design, I get the impression that they're not designed to be used in very large rooms, certainly not large home theater type settings. And for that reason, I think that the common consumer or I should say the typical consumer of this speaker is probably gonna be okay. That does it for my review. Just as a quick wrap up, very neutral speaker, the bass out of the box, maybe a little bit too bloomy in that 100 Hertz region. And the bass in the data tends to indicate that as well. So you might wanna play around, or I should say, you definitely will wanna play around with placement and some of the EQ settings. But I think once you get those dialed in, you'll be really happy if this speaker has kind of been on the back burner for you for a while. I don't really think you'll have any regrets. Maximum SPL is something you wanna pay attention to. If you're more than 10 feet away, probably not gonna get loud enough for you. If you're 10 feet or closer, you should be okay. As I said earlier to start off this video, if you're interested in purchasing these, please consider using my affiliate link. It'll be in the comments section below. Let me know if you own these speakers, what you think about my assessment. I'd be really curious to know if we're kind of aligning here. And with that said, I will talk to you all later. Take care.